edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week, we're going to be looking at the case of Phoenix Engineering and UK Insurance Limited. And the citation for this case is 2019 UKSC 16. And this case arises out of someone being a complete idiot. And because it made its way up to the Supreme Court, we get to witness this foolishness on the podcast. The idiot in question is a Thomas Holden whose car had failed an MOT, and so he decided it would be a good idea to have a go at repairing it himself. Not only that, but he decided the best place to carry this out was at his place of work. The reason the car had failed the MOT was because of corrosion on the underside of the vehicle, and so he had decided to cover it up with metal plates. To get to the underside of the vehicle, he used a forklift truck to put it on its side, and then used a welder to continue his work. Holden then got a phone call during this and decided that rather than ignore it and continue on with his work, he would instead answer it. As a matter of fact, it was a good job that he did, because when he stood up, he noticed that the sparks had caused the inside of the car to go up in flames. Unfortunately, by this point, it was beyond his ability to control the fire, and so although he escaped, by the time the firefighters had had the blaze under control, it had caused £2 million worth of damage to both Phoenix Engineering, where he worked, as well as other surrounding properties. You will also notice that Phoenix are one of the parties to this case, but in reality it is their insurer, AXA, who are behind these proceedings. They did pay out the £2 million from the claim, and they have even decided not to pursue Holden personally for the money, although that is not saying much as you're not going to get that sort of money out of a mechanical fitter from Burnley. However, they have instead pursued the car insurance company Churchill, who, in the context of this case, go by their official name of UK Insurance Limited. This is where we find the source of the dispute, as Churchill are not keen on the idea of paying up, and therefore argue that the insurance policy does not cover this liability. Before we can even begin to think about answering this question, we need to examine this insurance policy carefully, And the specific bit that is relevant here is Clause 1A, which states, quote, We will cover you for your legal responsibility if you have an accident in your vehicle and you kill or injure someone or you damage their property, end quote. That is not the only thing that the court will have to consider, however. Every insurance policy has to also satisfy the relevant parts of the Road Traffic Act 1988, and in particular Section 145, states that there must be cover, quote, in respect of any liability which may be incurred by him or them in respect of the death of or bodily injury to any person or damage to property caused by or arising out of the use of the vehicle on a road or other public place. When the case ended up in the High Court, the judge focused on what exactly it means to use a vehicle and held that repairing a vehicle does not constitute using it within the meaning of section 145. As a result, the policy did not cover the fire damage to Phoenix and the other buildings. That decision was appealed to the Court of Appeal, where the opposite conclusion was reached. That court took a much broader view of what it means to use a vehicle, and decided that it is consistent with EU case law to describe repairing a vehicle as using it for the purposes of the Act. Furthermore, the Court of Appeal also focused on the relevance of where the car was geographically located at the time. This might have presented a problem for Phoenix because the Act refers to the vehicle being used on a road or other public place, but we know that the fire took place on private property. In order to get around this, the Court of Appeal noted that the Act and the insurance policy have to be read side by side. And so because the policy does not place any geographical limitation on where the car has to be, this can take precedence such that the clause and the policy overall can make Churchill liable when read alongside the Road Traffic Act. When the case went before the Supreme Court, the justices first faced the problem of how these two documents, the insurance policy and the Act of Parliament, should interact. On the one hand, the policy has to be able to stand by itself, and be read as a contractual document. Nevertheless, the policy and certificate also have to be able to meet the requirements of the legislation, and so it may be necessary to read words into the agreement as a result of this. That is a powerful tool, and is certainly not one to be taken lightly. But the justices felt that the Court of Appeal had gone too far in this regard by essentially allowing for an interpretation 
that would mean any sort of accident involving the vehicle would be covered. Clearly that approach is just too wide-ranging, and so we instead have to go back to the fundamentals and arrive at a definition for what use means in this context. To be honest with you, the definition that is traditionally used by the English courts is not far from what you might come up with if you were tasked with defining what it means to use something yourself. If you use a fork, then you are operating it, and the same can be said for a vehicle. This obviously includes things like driving the vehicle, but has been extended by case law such that a person can be using a vehicle, even where it has broken down, as per Plumian and Vines from 1996. Altogether, English law takes a fairly flexible approach to the subject, but one important limitation that comes from the Road Traffic Act is that the vehicle must be being used on a road or other public place, as we discussed earlier. That stipulation does not exist in EU law, where use as a term covers pretty much anything to do with the normal functioning of the vehicle, with no restrictions on where that vehicle is at the relevant time. At the moment, UK law and EU law do not sit together, and this is likely something that Parliament will have to consider at some point, even if they eventually decide that Brexit means that there is no change to the legislation required. In any case, it is UK law that takes precedence, and so that is what is implied into the insurance policy, even though that also means implying the geographical limitation as well. While we are on the subject of linguistic interpretations, it is also worth briefly considering what it means to say that an accident has been caused or has arisen out of the use of a vehicle. In this situation, the answer is a little bit more simple, and we can use the authority from the 1956 case of Rumford Ice and Cold Storage Company Limited and Lister, where it was held that causing an accident means something like running over a pedestrian at a crossing, whereas an accident that merely arises from use of the vehicle would be where the driver loses control and the vehicle skids into that same pedestrian at the crossing. All of this has limited application here, but it does show that we can further build on this idea of usage, and yet at the same time there does also have to be some causal link that is maintained. Thus, for example, it would be too much of a stretch to argue that Holden's use of the vehicle caused the vehicle to need repairing, and then those repairs caused the fire that in turn caused the property damage. All of that is a little too far removed to be a credible basis for liability. Instead, a vehicle that is being repaired on private property is not being used for the purposes of the Road Traffic Act, and so the car insurance company Churchill was successful in defending this claim by AXA. As we begin to move away from the judgment and towards an analysis of this case, I do think it is worth briefly bringing up one of the other interesting arguments from the proceedings. It was suggested that what we are dealing with here is a consumer contract, and it is a well-established statutory rule that such contracts ought to be interpreted in such a way that they are as favourable to the consumer as is reasonable in the circumstances. To put it another way, the protection given by, to Holden by his car insurance should be given as wide a berth as possible, and that is something that should be factored into the linguistic interpretation by the court that we have just examined. If successful, this line of argument may have swung the case towards AXA, but the Supreme Court rejected it because the real aim of the judicial interpretation was to achieve an alignment between what was included in the policy and the provisions of the Road Traffic Act. There wasn't any real disagreement between the insurer and the insuree about what was intended, and this case was more about correcting a mistake in the wording that had originally been employed. I think that this is fair enough. For a start, the justices have been keen to emphasise throughout this judgement that while it may be necessary to add to the insurance coverage as it exists within the policy, it should go no further than what is required under the Road Traffic Act. However, that on its own is not really enough to justify the position that was adopted and so although it is not explicitly stated, another part of the reasoning is likely that this is not really a consumer contract that is being enforced by this point. After all, Holden was not really in the picture anymore by this point, as the case had taken on a life of its own, and it is altogether a bit unrealistic to treat AXA as a consumer when they themselves are an insurance company. What about the decision as a whole, though? How should we feel about the interpretation of the word use and in particular the disconnect that exists between the UK and EU version. 
Perhaps the best way to approach this question is to first of all take a step back and think about what we expect when we take out car insurance. In a perfect world, we would be covered for pretty much everything that we could think of, but that is not realistic, and so we do have to give thought to what we expect from the insurance companies. Now, they often have a very bad reputation for being stingy, but as the Supreme Court noted, there do have to be some limitations in place for insurance claims. Under the Road Traffic Act, as it currently stands, that line is drawn at private property, as we saw in this case, although it would not be impossible to foresee a more generous interpretation that brought the UK version much closer to the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union. The more interesting question is whether the UK Parliament should change the law to ensure that the two approaches do line up when it comes to future cases. In other words, should that limit of what insurance does cover be pushed further outwards? Normally such an alignment is desirable, but insurance is one of those areas that does vary greatly from one legal culture to another. And so we shouldn't necessarily just automatically jump in line with other member states. After all, these are very unusual circumstances. Holden was not only on private land, but was negligently attempting to repair his own car in a haphazard fashion, instead of seeking expert help. Are we sure that we actually want insurance to cover this situation when it is so far from the normal use of a vehicle, and other forms of insurance, such as that for the buildings, appear to be more appropriate? It could be said that I am being a little bit harsh, and it will ultimately be up to Parliament to make a final decision, but while it is always tempting to favour the consumer when designing policy, this is still a balancing act that draws upon a wide range of factors. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode, and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. Special thanks this week go to The Medical Law Geek, who left a 5-star rating for the podcast on iTunes. That's very much appreciated, and if any of you other listeners haven't had a chance to rate and review the podcast on iTunes yet, then please do so. I really appreciate it, uh, and it helps to get the word of the podcast out there amongst the community. Well, thank you very much for listening. I'll be back with another case next week, but for now, bye!